Welcome to Spiritual Naturalism Today, a conversation on science, nature, and spirituality. Our program is sponsored by the Spiritual Naturalist Society with host Daniel Strain. This is part two of episode six, Secular Buddhism, an interview with Ted Meisner. So, um... Tell us about yourself. How did you uh, come to secular Buddhism? And, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got involved with all this and where you're coming from. Sure. Um, well, like I, a lot of people uh, in this community, I, I have a science background. I am a contemporary Westerner. I have always been an atheist. And so supernatural assertions, whatever their context, not even necessarily in a, a religious context, but any kind of supernatural context. I can bend spoons with my mind. I don't think so. <laughs> and we can put that to the test. Um, so having that uh, way of being when we're really in the United States in a fairly Christian dominated situation, and there is a presumption of uh, Christian privilege in our society. We see this every time there's a case where um, we're going to put the Ten Commandments up in, in the government building, and that is fought by a group that says, okay, that means we're also going to have a test statue to Satan. If you're you're going to put up your nativity scene over Christmas, we're going to have one for the Satanists, and you guys open the door to this because you didn't want to keep the difference between church and state. So enter into that uh, many years ago, over two decades ago, having some difficulties with concentration and focus and hearing from a friend that, you know, I've heard meditation is good for that. And there is a meditation center, a Minnesota Zen Meditation Center on Lake Calhoun here in Minneapolis. And I, maybe that would help. And since I already had an interest in Japanese culture and aesthetics, and I, I uh, was, would eventually start to learn to play the Japanese flute and was doing karate, things like this, it was a natural fit. So I was happy to go there. And uh, I went and was greeted at the door by a gentleman who was bald and in robes. And that was very strange. There was a a visceral response to what am I getting into and an uncertainty because this was uh, a time when, when I grew up that, that meant cult bald and robes equaled cult. And it was something to be careful of, but went ahead anyway and did the basic meditation. It was an introduction to meditation session. And it was that 10 minutes with a great teacher, a gentleman who's become one of my favorite teachers over the years, was the hardest 10 minutes <laughs> of meditation <laughs> I had ever done. And yet there was something there that was very compelling. And so I kept going and kept practicing and started to learn a little bit more about what the religion itself says and found some interesting things there, but also found some stuff that just didn't makes sense to me. Uh, some of the supernatural assertions, some of the um, ideological stances that are not ones that are part of the natural world or are testable, uh, and things like the hierarchical structures of a religious institution uh, were also a little problematic for me. And so there's always this cognitive dissonance of doing the practice, the meditation, and the effects, the wonderful effects I was seeing on me and the other people who were part of the center. Uh, and that never really went away. And so there's always a, boy, this doesn't feel quite right. And I knew there were a lot of people there who didn't accept and still don't accept many of the trappings and things that I had run into. Eventually, I... Um, started to explore Theravada practice. And for me, that was a very big door opening because it invited more, I'd say, scholarship, uh, more academic learning 
from the old, old Pali Canon, uh, the mm. source for uh, all of this. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, the interesting thing about uh, Theravada is to me is that it's uh, the older and it's more narrow in its uh, canon. And it seems to be closer to uh, the, um, well, as best as we can figure or reconstruct what the Buddha taught. And, and the only reason that that's important is because in Buddhism, it, it, it seems to me that you've got an inverse of what you've got going in most other religions, where the conservative Buddhism is the more, uh, tends to be the more secularized or more secular compatible than in the liberal Buddhism is the one that was added is, is the one that has more added to it as time goes by and tends to get more and more elements that are less compatible with naturalism. Um, that's not to say that I don't think that there's a lot of wonderful things in Mahayana and uh, even Tibetan Buddhism, but um, I was also drawn to Theravada for that same reason. So. Yeah, yeah, and that that was you hit it right on the head. It was just a, a wonderfully insightful way of unpacking the experiences I was having in meditation in a way that uh, where I was uh, wasn't really doing for me. And so that grew and grew, and yet there was still a bit of the dissonance there that didn't change because it had different supernatural aspects uh, that didn't sit so well for me. And uh, and eventually that led to wanting to do a podcast, not being sure about what, maybe skepticism, maybe logical fallacies, maybe critical thinking, what could it be? And there are already lots of excellent podcasts on all of those. And it, it came to me in discussing this with a, a dear friend in Mexico that, oh, this this Buddhism stuff, I know this pretty well at this point. It's been about 20 years. Um, and yet I'm, I'm still not a priest. I'm never going to be. That's a conscious decision. What is it that I, I am? I, how would one describe this to others? And kind of landed on the word secular as being the most appropriate. And again, not an aversion to that because I love the tradition. Uh, it's, it was just a way to describe it being less about the religious, finger quotes in the air, religious aspects of it, and more about what I do in this lifetime, what I directly experience and can know in this one life, which is the only one that I do know as best as I can, for sure, unless it we're in the Matrix or there's an, an evil demon um, fooling us all that I know is real. And so I started, uh, this actually grew out of a discussion with Minnesota atheists. They interviewed me um, about Buddhism because I, I was one of the few people they had had who was still actively a part of the religion <laughs> that they were talking about. And two things happened from those uh, those interviews. First was the atheist community that I've been part of said, I get it now. You just you, you described that very well. I, this makes sense. I can see why someone would be an out and active atheist and still do this Buddhism thing. That makes sense. It's about what you do. The second thing that happened is the Buddhist community who listened to the episode said, that was great. That was exactly what we do. You're right. And I understand why you do this atheism thing that you do. <laughs> and I, I realized there's, okay, so this is not, I, I'm not alone in this. Um, this, this is really what I should be talking about. And so modeled the podcast after, uh, some in the, the skeptical community that are, are really outstanding podcasts and started doing an interview format. Uh, and, and was it the secular Buddhist association at that time or was it know, just it, a podcast or? You no, know, it's interesting. It grew originally. It was just the secular Buddhist and it was just me. I, talking to people it was the best not job I ever had. Still is the best <laughs> not job I have. Uh, and from that, uh, I got to, because of the interview format, meet wonderful people. 
and grow to become good friends with them. I, I, all of you on this call, that's how we met and have had these interactions. And that's been the case growing over time. And what people would do, because I did start a Facebook group at the same time for the podcast, people would say, you know, we really want, we want to be able to interact with you and with others, with the people who you have on the podcast. And um, knowing how much time the podcast itself took, uh, I knew I wouldn't be able to commit to the technical challenges of doing that. But fortunately, others who are part of this, Dana Nuri, Dana's awesome, she's our technical director, volunteered. And so we ended up with the participation and support of Dana, Mark Nickelbein, the practice circle, um, Doug Smith blogging, I just so many wonderful people doing great things. It grew into the Secular Buddhist Association. And Stephen Batchelor very kindly uh, gave us the domain secularbuddhism.org and seculardharma.org. He owned those and, and I transferred those to me for the SBA. And it's grown from there so that at, at this point, a few years later, and it's only been a few years, uh, the Secular Buddhist on our website, secularbuddhism.org, there are maybe 11 different secular Buddhist sites that specifically have the words secular and Buddhism in them in nine different countries, in several different languages. That's we have amazing. ones in the UK, ones in Australia, but also ones in, you know, Italy and Germany and other countries. So, and they're, and they're continuing and their work is amazing. Some of the things that they're putting out. So being a, a hub for this and in, in particular, our, our friends in, uh, in New Zealand, the, uh, uh, the secular Buddhists who are there are incredibly active. Ramsey Margolis does amazing stuff. Uh, and it's become really its own not just its own branch, but uh, when I started the podcast, everyone asked, what is that? Uh, Daniels, we did at the beginning of this episode. Mm -hmm. And now uh, people said, oh, yeah, I'm a secular Buddhist. And it's we're seeing it in Tricycle and Buddha Dharma and in articles online. The term mm -hmm. secular Buddhism is all over the place. And it wasn't when we started the podcast. And so hoping that there's been a positive influence of just that discussion about what this might be, and it's not bad, and it's not taking away from the tradition. It's another kind of evolution in the Dharma. I got a question for you, Ted. Sure. It, it's just, it's one of those personal, I wonder. Um, originally, I, I kind of thought Stephen Batchelor came up with the the secular Buddhism. So you actually beat Batchelor on that? Uh, it's... I don't know. It's a great question. I know that um, Stephen, I, I'm going to give credit to Stephen, and it's going to be an unsighted, unreferenced credit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and it's interesting because Stephen has, people have come to me and said, yes, I, I asked about the invention of the term secular Buddhism, and they said that was, that was you, Ted. And so I, I'm going to say it was Stephen. He's... <laughs> <laughs> he has the the most well uh, formulated uh, mind around this stuff, I think. Uh, so we'll just go with it's Stevens and, and say it's there. And uh, interestingly enough, I didn't I didn't know Stephen when I started the podcast. It's through the podcast that we met. I, I think it was just I think it was time. I think it was one of those things: the convergence of Buddhism with a uh, secular culture as the practitioners. They went from, you know, originally it was like Suzuki Roshi and the the Zen invasion, as you would yeah. might envision it, and then the Theravada with the the Vipassana uh, movement, the mindfulness movement, and then uh, Zen with his uh, mindfulness stress reduction. I think it was a, a process of Buddhism and secular uh, European American culture coming together that it was that it was happening and people were looking at that. And I think both you and bachelor said, ah, that's secular Buddhism. Yeah, yeah, it, it was an inevitable, uh, outcropping of Buddhism's yeah. encounter with modernity. 
and modernity having its own particular characteristics. Exactly. Less, a, a yep. more secular way of being. So this, as I have often told people, it's I, I'm just the doorway, man. I just hold the door open. <laughs> this is nothing I created. This is happening yeah. on its own. Uh, door holders are needed. <laughs> it's good to have that fallback <laughs> career. <laughs> yes, yes. Doesn't pay so well, but... <laughs> Well, um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, Buddhism has had a really profound impact on me and, uh, my wife and I attend the Jade Buddha Temple here in Houston. And, um, our first experience visiting there, um, highlighted to me one of the things that I hope that we maintain and carry forth, which is, when we stepped onto those temple grounds and we interacted with the people there and we left, there was a, uh, a completely different sense in the air um, that had to do with you could tell that these were people who were putting into practice something that um, related to a, a, a very compassionate, loving community. And the Buddhists have uh, very astutely recognized the connection between compassion and wisdom in a ve- in very intricate and elaborate ways. But um, that's what I think uh, – Secular people, naturalists, humanists, I think we need to really bring that up to the forefront. And uh, because if we are concerned about this life, then um, compassion is that underlying truth of the interconnectedness of all of us. And um, so I hope that uh, secular Buddhism will also continue to, uh, you know, carry that i mean i'm reminded of oddly enough i'm reminded of a christian uh martin luther king (laughs) but the reason i'm reminded of him is because he also like many humanists is uh was a uh political activist and so humanists are also politically active but if you look at the character and the way that Martin Luther King went about his political activism, it was always through love. And um, Thich Nhat Hanh, obviously, his activism related to the Vietnam War, um, they were good friends. And uh, I, I would hope that, you know, we could we could form a movement and build and continue a movement that when people who aren't, you know, one of us, quote unquote, and people who have a different view when they look at us, if the first thing they think isn't, that's the guy who ridicules my beliefs, but that's a, that's a really loving, kind person um, who doesn't happen to believe what I believe. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, that's... it's kind of like the Dalai Lama's uh, statement, uh, my religion is kindness. Right. Exactly, yes. Jay. And you're, what you're touching on is the, a very important aspect of, I think, any human way of being. This is not specifically Christian or Buddhist. or Nobody owns compassion and kindness and caring. And it's very frustrating when I, I hear some people in the Buddhist tradition who get very upset about mindfulness, this mindfulness movement, and they're ruining Buddhism, and they're watering down Buddhism, and they're only teaching mindfulness to the military so they make more efficient killers, and they're only trying to capitalize it in mindfulness to the corporations. Yeah. All spoken by people who have zero experience with any of that. Uh, i got to say that this is really about our increasingly <laughs> interconnected world, our global community, that it is very diverse and how we make, how we, instead of um, finding ways to exclude more people from our table, how do we make a bigger table? How do we make more room? Include them. And and that includes a a very strong uh, advocate for 
diversity and inclusion efforts, that it needs to be more than what I typically see in uh, Western Sangha's communities is tend to be a particular demographic. And how do do we change that? The folks at East Bay Meditation Center uh, in California are just doing outstanding work in having a vibrant and diverse, a sincerely diverse community, not because it's a checkbox of something they should do. No, because that's what the community is. And so they're right. I just I, I want to make special recognition for the wonderful people, Brenda Salgado, Mushim uh, Ikeda and others there who are doing such a wonderful job of modeling what we should see as human beings, not just as Buddhists, exactly. Christians or secular mm. humanists or spiritual naturalists, but as human beings. How do we think about a human people? family? Yeah, I think it might it's begin the with family. the uh, with the listening and hum- humble listening to the needs of other people, and uh, who, who live in all kinds of different places and conditions, mm-hmm. and have different experiences. Well, I really appreciate um, your time with us. Um, we're getting close to. The end of our time. Um, did Jay or Brandon, did either of you have any more questions for Ted? I think it's, it's Brandon's. Yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to throw one thing out there. Not a question because we probably don't have time for that. But I, I, I'm just aware that there's probably people who haven't listened to this podcast before but are listening to this episode because they're interested in secular Buddhism. But they might also be wondering what spiritual naturalism is. And so maybe just to throw a little bit out there, just a hook. <laughs> so you might want to listen to a few more, more podcasts. Oh, sure. Uh, the way that we think about spiritual naturalism in the Spiritual Natural Society is any path that combines a naturalistic perspective with spirituality, meaning a focus on growth, connectedness, meaning being a good person, that kind of thing. And we consider that to include any path that, that by default fits that, such as da, 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 secular Buddhism, <laughs> along with a whole bunch of others. Um, so secular Buddhism, spiritual naturalism, not the difference, or what's the difference? Um, nothing. <laughs> it's just it would be included within spiritual naturalism. You guys are definitely a part of our family, and um, we we really admire watching your. I mean, really love watching your success and. Uh, Everything the SBA is doing, uh, we fully support and, and praise. Excellent. And back at you, you guys have done amazing work. And just thinking about it, what what it's like compared to when you started just a few years ago and how much <laughs> spiritual and natural society has grown and what you've accomplished. And Brandon, the way you put that, of you know, spiritual in the sense of that which – personally moves and transforms you. We don't have to mean spiritual in the Casper sense. It doesn't need to be a dichotomy of soul and spirit or mind and body as connected but different things. It's just how are we in the world. Sure. And from from a humanist humanist standpoint, it would be self-actualization. Would be the spirituality of a of a humanist. Well, like you mentioned earlier, Ted, um, one of my favorite things about seeing the growth of these organizations is the opportunity I've had to make new friends. Um, yourself and BT and Jay and all of the other people on our staff um, and the people in our community and our members. I mean, the the people that I've met and been able to interact with is really. You know, really just, it's our sangha, you know, it's our community, uh, and supporting one another in our practice and in our lives and in the projects that we really care about. Um, it's just been wonderful. And so, uh, and so have you. So <laughs> thank you again. I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up then. Uh, did you have any, uh, anything you wanted to say before I wrap up, Ted? Just parting words of deep gratitude for all that you're doing and and really looking forward to the next several years of 
ongoing growth and bridge building and making a bigger table. Guys, thank you so much for all the work you do and everything everyone at the Spiritual Naturalist Society is doing. It's wonderful. Feel good about it because that's helping to change things a little bit at a time. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. Um, we will uh, be back with our next episode in one month. We're releasing them monthly now. And uh, if you enjoyed this, please uh, give us a comment on our uh, web page at and uh, spiritualnaturalistsociety.org. And if you'd like to check out the Secular Buddhist Association's website, it's secularbuddhism.org. Is that right, Ted? That is correct. Okay. And, um, okay, well, that's it for today. Thank you. This program was sponsored by the Spiritual Naturalist Society. Learn more and join our community at spiritualnaturalistsociety.org. Our music was composed by John Clemis Rude. J.N. Forrest is our technical director, and Daniel Strain is program director. Our hosts are Daniel, J., and B.T. Newberg. Please share our program with others and join us next time on Spiritual Naturalism Today. Today.